thank you for coming to the last session of the day before this fun bit. Uh, so I'm going to talk you through this subject. Okay. I'm going to talk to you about the new old kid on the block, which is called OpenJ9 or Eclipse OpenJ9. Okay. So me, I work for IBM. I'm a developer advocate. I work. I do JVMs. That's always been my my thing. And this, the talk is about JVMs. And I've also done some DevOps stuff and things like that. So I'm eclectic. And I get the job of going out and talking about tech, which is just great fun. People get pay me to try things out and go off and talk about them. Though this is obviously something that my whole team works on. So I have a lot more vested interest and um, exposure to. So we're going to talk about this thing, OpenJ9. This was IBM has for a long time had a VM called J9. And for various reasons which we'll talk about, uh, it was contributed to uh, OpenJ2 Eclipse in September under the usual sorts of licenses. So you can get under VPL or Apache, which is cool. Okay, and we'll talk through why we did that and the benefits that it can give you as a, as a Java user if switching over to OpenJ9. So historically, you look at how Java has evolved. Java has evolved under economic pressures, right? We all do things for reasons, and the reasons are always money-driven one way or the other. And so Java has tuned itself to benchmarks that look like this, right? We've all, you've probably seen them. If you've done any Java over time, you've looked at benchmarks. There's always this shape. Right, there's always this curvy thing, which looks a bit more like this. And so what we've done over time is we've said Java Java performance is something that we can take time to receive max reach maximum. So if you're if you're developing and distributing Java and you're running it, you start your app server, you're willing to take time for the throughput, the red line, to reach maximum because this is the time it takes for the VM to get up to running and jitting your code and doing all that sort of stuff, right? That's really cool. It's, that's what we're doing. I have time to do this, so it's, well, it's, let's spare, put more effort at the front to get the maximum throughput. And as a part of that consequence, you get this white line, which is the memory consumption. And you don't see that so much in the benchmarks, but it's there under the covers, and you'll see where lots of times you end up with this peak. Right, loads of memory being used to give you maximum throughput, okay, and then finally that's all gone, and now you're into a steady state, right? And and that's what Java World has asked for, and that's what all the JVMs have been doing, and that's what we tune ourselves for, okay? However, there's a new world, and it's called Cloud. Anybody come across Cloud? Okay, uh, and Cloud doesn't think that way. The cloud has a different view of life, right? So when you look at cloud and you look at it like this, you think about it as I, it's compute power. I'm going to go buy some for a small, small amount of time. Yeah, turn the tap on, get some compute, turn it off. That's a different economic model, right? That changes things. What it does is, indirectly, is it brings the relationship between that money that you spend and the work that you're doing so much more close. Prior to that, we've all been very good at buying a, buying metal and big servers and running them, okay, and going, yeah, I've got a big machine and it does what it's supposed to do. Maybe I'll upgrade it every now and then, but I, the relationship between the work that I do and the thing, it's the machine itself, is not as obvious you might, as, as you might expect. When you get to cloud, that relationship is this, compute equals money. All the way through this, we're talking about that relationship. As now that other parts of your business look at the cloud and they go, yeah, yeah, so you wanna buy some cloud stuff from Amazon or IBM, IBM or Google or whatever, it costs so much money, yes? So suddenly they can measure it because of how much you're using. So you go, I need, a I need to buy an Amazon VM, it's gonna cost this amount of money, I'm gonna get this amount of RAM and blah, 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 there we are, okay? And they go, thank you very much. Now they understand that dollars equals RAM or dollars equals CPU, okay? As Soon as you make that relationship, what happens? 
people will start saying to you, what can you do to reduce that? What can you do to get more value? Okay. And for us Java developers, this relationship of compute equals money is mostly measured by this thing, gigabytes per hour. When you buy stuff, and you're basically you're renting capacity capability, you buy mostly gigabytes per hour. Right? When you go to a cloud, the CPU space, um, capacity is a bit hit and miss. You, know, you can buy large things or small ones, but there's not much in it. But the amount of memory you use, it's quite up to you. Okay? And so you buy gigabytes per hour. So that is the big metric that you worry about. And as Java programmers, you can think of it like this. Yeah, dash XMX equals $100. But that's what you're doing. When you take memory, you're taking money. So now what that means is, if you put a new feature in, or you change your dependency, and you have to increase your heap space, because even just a little bit, that number goes up. Your accountant's going to go, excuse me, are you getting value for that increase? Okay. So suddenly you see more and more focus on this. Okay, it might not be, I've made it $101, that may not be a problem. You might go, hey, now I'm into the next tier of machines on Amazon. Suddenly it's a big deal, okay? Right. So when you go back to the workload, okay? So yeah, that's what we say with, um, the profile of workload is for benchmarks, but that's not real, is it? Well, you know, your workload is more like this. Stuff comes in, right? You work, you, res you respond to it, okay? It's up, down, up, down. I mean, you, unless you've really got a very stable business, your prediction of what your workload is going to look like is going to be slightly hit and miss. You know, you might go, well, it goes up on Friday nights and it goes down on Saturday mornings. But in general, you get some wiggle, right? How do you take your existing application and stick it in the cloud to support that amount of demand. So you can do this bit. You can go and buy the equivalent of one big server that equip, that's equates to whatever you have under your desk or in your data center, okay? And you scale it so that it's as big as the biggest peak you imagine happening. Because that's what you'd have done. You'd have bought hardware to deal with that, wouldn't you? Because you're not, you can't suddenly add more hardware, so you buy the biggest thing. So that's what you do. And of course, if you take that to the cloud, everything, oops, everything above that white line is wasted money. Because if you've bought this amount of RAM and it only gets used, that's good. But you've bought all of this stuff, and when it's not being used, it costs you money. Yes? So what do we do? What does cloud tell you the answer is to help you reduce your expense? Well, it says to you, well, how about smaller units of work? things that don't live so long, things that can f start faster. If you make them smaller, conceptually, they can fit the curve better. Right. And if you make them really small, you can get a really good fit. This is called microservices. This is almost the biggest driver, probably the biggest driver for why we have microservices, because it's an architecture that lets us respond to the demand without wasting resource. So there's a bit more to it than that. So cloud says to you, uh, yeah, so small footprint, please. The less memory you use, the cheaper you are, okay? Small deployment sizes. I want little tiny Docker images, not big fat Docker images or big fat wars, because that costs time to deploy. And also you may be paying for bandwidth. So I don't know if you were the, one of those panels when Martin was talking, Martin Verbo was talking about writings and logging over a satellite link okay cost you money so you don't want to do that okay and you want fast starting applications why because all the time that you're waiting for something to get up to full speed any work that's coming in is going to be running somewhere else so you end up in a situation where you've probably got stuff hanging around services running around and hanging around because you can't get enough things started fast enough so we want really fast applications and when you're not busy, you don't want to use resource. Give it back. Don't spend CPU, right? Don't use memory. Give back what you can, because you may find that gives you a benefit. 
So let's put those words differently. Let's go back to pictures. Right. So let's take one of these. Right. So we have some demand. And you've got one of these little blocks. Let's look at these little microservices. Okay. Wow. So the funny thing is, is you still end up with this sort of shape. Even if you take one of those microservices and you said it's going to be Java, nothing's changed other than people saying, hey, write your Java as a microservice. Don't expect it to live too long, right? But it's still your Java. And you still have this basic shape because that's how Java's been, been tuned. And that means that this delay for how long it takes you to get from nothing to through full maximum throughput costs you money because you've got another one of these running around doing workload, right? Because this one's not ready. And if you use more resource as a part of starting up that you never then use again, you've paid for that too. So again, if you're in one of those situations where overpeak gets you into the next tier of um, VMs or Amazon or wherever, just to get started, you're paying more money, okay? So we don't want that. We want this. We want a shape where the relationship between throughput and memory is pretty straightforward and that it starts as quickly as possible, ideally instantly on, okay? And then no peaks, no weird things that happen, okay? So a bunch of words, but what does that mean for you? So first off, your XMX thing is going to affect costs. And your accountants understand that. Your business guys understand that, right? You're going to get a bill. Your ops guys gets bills for why is it that it's costing us so much to, in Amazon? It's like, well, there we are. We can track it back to your application. And there are some companies that literally do that. You deploy something and they'll go, the bill's gone up. Did I get value for that service increase in memory? Right? Okay. So you're going to be fitting your application into smaller ramp sizes because somebody's going to say you can't buy that much stuff, right? Okay, and you'll be looking where the memory goes. Your selection of dependencies is going to be driven by how much it costs to run. You might find that you're sitting there driving, I know, I know do I pick that linked that link list implementation or that one? Well, that uses a load of memory in fast. This one uses no memory in slow. Oh, I've got an economic choice, okay? And every time that you've got multiple microservices, Every time you increase the value, the memory use of one, of course, you're paying the cost times number of microservices, right? So we have all these new things. And you believe me, once start people like measuring you, they're going to start saying, what can you do to be more economic? What can you do more economic? Because, like it says here, the little bits add up. If people can find ways to help, can I just shave a little bit off one of your microservices memory use? Okay because it's little bits add up to big numbers. And this is all straightforward economics, okay? So in the cloud, it's all about footprint, right? But cloud providers themselves also have some interest too, okay? So let's talk a little bit more about their view, and then eventually I'll get on to talk about the OpenGenI, right? So the interesting thing is that the way that the cloud providers are changing their view of hardware. And cloud providers can be the big ones, but it's also little ones. It can even be data centers. It's like, it's still the same sort of things. So we used to do the thing where we'd have uh, 50,000 little machines, and then if one would fail, you'd kill it and start and go buy a new one, okay? But actually the economics and the value now say it's better to have larger machines that you break into virtualized into small partitions than have lots of little tiny physical machines, okay? The pressure is more and more towards bigger ones, okay? The microservices thing, though, pushes us in a different way. So you've got um, the, vent, the hardware guys, the cloud guys, trying to have bigger machines because bigger machines are more cost-effective. You can share more, right? So when you've got a large machine and you've got a bunch of virtualization, there's a whole bunch of opportunities for sharing. When you have lots of physical, small physical machines, there's no opportunity for sharing. But when you get to what we're doing in the application space, we're moving from places where we have used to have maybe one OS running a whole bunch of VMs, we're running app servers, applications, 
lots of opportunities for sharing of code, data, okay? But that's changing because what's actually happening now is, is we're going to this model, which is much more containerized, where you don't have opportunities to share because now you've just got a container that's got a VM and an app server application in it, and you're running loads of those, okay? So the hardware guys are going, the cloud guys are going one way, whereas us as application developers are, because the same economics are driving us to do a different st structure, okay? Right? So the providers themselves are going, well, how do I deal with this? How do I find ways to get my memory saving? Because if I can save, if I can find ways to save memory, it saves me money because I can use that memory for another application, okay? Also, when your application is not doing anything, if I know that you're idle, I can swap you out. I can reduce the memory. Uh, maybe ever you can get the VM to do a GC while it's not busy, right? Right? And the cloud providers are the same thing as everybody else is how quickly can I get this starting? Because again, if I can get it starting quicker, I want my, I mean, not, this is not a VM statement, this is like how fast can I get the underlying VM and OS running? Then again, the kind of how that saves them money, makes them competitive. So, how does this help? How does OpenJ9 make your life so much better? Okay, do you want to know? Okay, right. So let me tell you. So I talked about this. It was a, you know released in September, and here we are October in 2018, uh, and adoption is growing. Right? And part of the talk here is just to share it with you guys and say, try it out and tell us what you think. Right? But this thing will help you with some of those stories. It will help you because it started here, right? Now, like all large companies, we try different things out. And as a large company, we've been doing Java for a long time. I've been doing Java for a long, well, before, as I say, before it was one, right? And we've tried all sorts of different ways and all different technologies, and we acquired a company. And the company had this thing called, uh, well, it was precursor to J9. And it was designed to go in this space because that was really important. We didn't have a really good mobile Java ME space. We don't really care about that anymore, right? Well, we care-ish, but that's where it started, okay? Bear with me on this. When you look at what little devices care about, they care about small footprint. They don't have much RAM. They have lots of ROM, but they don't have much RAM. They want fast startup. You know, the last thing you want to do when you start your game on your phone is it to say yeah loading come back in an hour you know you don't want to do that do you you know you know it, I, it winds me up something chronic when I try and sit down and play a game and I turn the computer on and I've got to compute and then Windows says up installing updates and all that stuff it just winds me up. I want it to start right I'm not here to do that I'm here to play the game and it's the same on phones okay and also when these things start you don't want to have an, inf an experience where it's not very good to start off with but it gets better Right? You don't want to be playing, I don't know, pick your favorite uh, you know, first person shooter and you go, hey, it starts off in blocky characters, you know, and eventually it's got 4K resolution. It's like, no, I don't want that. I'm not going to play that game. Right? So that's, what's, that's what the, this was designed to do, was to, was to prevent that. And those are exactly the same as cloud. Small footprint, faster startup, right? faster scaling, and instant. We want to get to full on, okay? So OpenJ9 started here, and that was its original purpose, but, uh, but it didn't stay there because very quickly we went, this is a really good code base because this code base is flexible. It has those characteristics, but it has a whole bunch of flexibility. So now we can run on that, and we can run on one of these. So this is IBM Z14. This is a mainframe. This is the current mainframe, okay? It's 32 terabytes of RAM, sorry, terabytes of RAM, 170 processors, right? 32 terabytes of RAM. We can carve this up any way you want. The maximum you can get is, you can get a Linux um, LPAR, which will give, you can get like 10 terabytes. So we can, open J9, can run on machines that can provide 10 terabytes to operating system. We can use that amount of memory, okay? Anybody, anybody want to buy one? Okay, 
Huh? Uh, fully populated, a few million. Yeah, no, it's not that bad. Yeah, but it's there. Everybody says, oh, mainframes are old. It's like, no, no, these are cutting edge. You know what I said before about moving from lots of smaller devices to bigger devices? Well, we have a lot of people buying that just for those reasons, because these things run Linux and things like that. Okay. Anyway, so OpenJ9 has been designed for the whole range of environments. So we do small devices, we do big devices, we do every operating system known to man, apart from Spark, um, because IBM puts all its products on all these different platforms, uh, different size machines, okay, and it's that. And as part of that, we've also got things like real soft real-time GC, which you get for free if you're interested in that, and uh, interesting caching technology, which I'll just show, uh, talk about, uh, that is really beginning to pay off for cloud. So the caching thing, you know, going back to this little challenge that we had between sharing. So when you move from a structure where sharing is easy to a structure where sharing is hard, then OpenJ9 has a caching technology that lets you share stuff between Docker containers. In fact, it lets you share stuff across the board. So in fact, you can share it between a Docker container and a, and a VM and some bare metal, right? It's not contained, constrained to the container it's running in. So that's really good for startup because we can share stuff and of course for memory footprint. It's easy to turn on, there's a couple of options. Dash X share classes are in that mode and you can limit how much stuff you wanna share. So the reason this works for us is because of the way that the system is designed. Who knows what a class file is? Yeah, okay. Who's ever looked at a class file format? Okay. Who thinks a class file format was designed to run on toasters? Okay. <laughs> class file format is designed to have the smallest amount of bytes because it was designed to go over a network that pre-internet, right, to run on tiny machines, right? this thing. Turns out not very good. Okay. Okay. It's just not very good for what we want to do with it. So many of the things the VM do does is it loads the class file up and goes, okay, let me rearrange that to a new form so I can actually do something useful with it. Okay. So when we do that, we break things into two parts. So we split out the stuff that is ROMable, i.e. read only, and we work it spit out the stuff that is actually mutatable and it's not just um, bits and bytes it's also if we can figure out when we realize the class file because we've got the jits involved and so we can work out that actually you say it's mutable but we can prove it's not that actually it's never going to change sticks in there so we can share it okay so that's good because that means that when you've got a structure like this where you've got multiple machines multiple jvms uh, running the same code on the same machine, okay? Well, you've got you've got your um, RAM and your ROM, okay? Re this is the stuff you can share. This is the stuff that's going to be individual, right? You can share that stuff. So you can take those things and you can have one, okay? So what does that mean is, well, faster startup because we're going to go, hey, we've already got that done, We've already, we've already done the pre-processing. So when we load the class, we can go, oh, actually, we've already got, we've already seen that. We know what it should look like. We're done. So this, the whole VM startup's time is faster because we've already figured out what you, um, what you need to do, how we need to, to lay it out, okay? And the thing is that because of the way this is structured, what's in the shared class, it's not restricted to, hey, it's gotta be on the same machine, right? or within the same VM, because at the end of this is just bits and bytes. And as long as we can get the VM to see it, so we can have a VM running in a container, can see this car, car, cast cache, then it can access it and use it as much as a VM running on bare metal or on a VM, on a VM, on a VM. As long as it can find it, and then it's just bytes, then you get that benefit, okay? And just by doing that, just by sharing things, we get 25, 20% footprint reduction, 
okay and it's faster right why is it faster well because we already know what to do with the class okay. but it's not just bits and bytes that's the easy bit you know classes that's all data it's all structure and stuff like that sitting around the class is of course some real code and hey we can show that too we can jet the code once and because we can generate position independent JIT code that means you can run it anywhere you're not restrained by uh, specific positioning we can take the dynamic AOT so we're basically if you imagine what happens JIT's VM start off they do some jitting of code and then they keep they keep it and then you kill it and you start the VM again and you go through and JIT the same stuff okay which is what we do in containers and that's such a waste if you share the JIT code you cache it as well then when you start up not only do you get startup performance because we've already dealt with the class file we've also jitted your code so the next container or the next vm that finds that's pointing to the share classes gets the benefit much faster startup okay and that bit just by doing that improves startup performance somewhere between 10 and 30 percent right just by saying i'm just going to share some jitted code that i used last time okay now there's some distinctions you don't get this out of the box the first time because somebody's got to pay it but once you've run it and kept it then the second time the warm run you've already got jitted code and this isn't static right if your application changes things if your application workload changes and the jit optimization re-optimization kicks in we save it back so everybody benefits okay and there's some words there like you know hundreds of, aot loads are 100 percent time 100 times faster than jit can than JIT compilations, which is sort of too true because hey, AOT we've done, we don't, we're basically not doing something. So I could argue it's an infinite, okay? Right. Right. Now, as it says, we're not, it's not perfectly going to be, we can share every single piece of JIT code that, we, that we've JITed, okay? But we're working on it, this is what we've got so far. Um, and there's more tuning options you can use. Quick starts says what it say, does what it says. Okay, and then also if you turn on some flags, we can start saying things like, "Hey, you're running in containers." This is now auto discoverable, so we know a lot more about that fact you're running in a container. We're also much more aware of the fact that you're what the container says the environment looks like, rather than what the the, the surrounding VM says. Right. There's lots of words here. Let's skip over the words. Okay. Uh, oh, I should mention this though. I said uh, said at uh, some point back about the providers uh, getting some benefit. So there's a situation in your app when your application is busy, right? And you're doing all this work, you're creating all this stuff, and you're going. I can't do a GC now, right? Because it would impact your throughput. Okay. Uh, but it would be really nice to know that when you reach the point where application is quiet, gone idle, do a GC. So what OpenJ9 has is an option to do that. When you turn that on, we are going to work out whether you're actually busy or not, which has actually turned out to be really hard to do. But actually, the idle detection here is really good. Uh, and it's um, the amount of effort we have to spend to work out whether you're idle is significantly lower. And what does that mean? It means when you're idle, you'd like to a GC, wouldn't you? So that because everything's quiet. So you do a GC, and then when the workload picks up, you haven't suddenly got to do a GC. It's already done. Okay. So there's a whole bunch of are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you idle? Are you idle? Okay. We find it, and that's basically what happens. We spot that you're idle, and then we kick a GC in. But it's more than that, because once you do a GC and you do any sort of memory compaction, now you've got pages of memory you can give back to the operating system. So it does not affect you as a JVM, as, a, as an application developer, but it means if I can give the memory back, then somebody else, another application running on that process can use on that machine, can use that memory. So you can actually get more throughput from the machine just by giving back memory when you're not using it. Okay. So... How does that translate into things like Java? 
because that's what we care about. Okay, well, so here's Hotspot. Okay, uh, I'm not sure what version of Hotspot it was. I just that's uh, this is pretty much the same uh, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Uh, it gets slightly better, but uh, Hotspot numbers, Open J9, about the same. Turn on share classes, quick start, and you get 30% faster startup. Okay, just by a couple of options and, uh, and, and turning it on. Okay. If you just switch your VM, Hotspot, switch over to OpenJ9, no command line options, no changes, just switch your VM, you get 6%. And this is pretty consistent, right? And the reason it's pretty consistent is because of the way that OpenJ9 is designed. It's not a trick. It's just it was designed for a much more frugal environment. Okay, so you just get that, that improvement. And if you turn on the, the options to get the other thing, then it's about the same. There's no downsides to, to, to extra sharing. Okay. And things like the idle detection well, I think the graphs are pretty difficult to, to um, interpret. So, but basically, we are much better at spotting a, a GC idle, and actually not only better at doing it, it costs us less to actually spot it. So I think in hindsight, I should not have put that chart in. All right, so, yeah, do you get it? No, okay, so back to the benchmark. We have this wonderful benchmark that we would like to look like, this profile of Java application that we'd like to have, okay? How well do we do? So here's open, which you can't read, open JDK9 with hotspot. Okay, so standard benchmark, but I can pretty much draw this line for any application. Okay, over time, it takes that sort of curve to get to the point where you're running at steady state. Okay, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's, that's, that's what we all do. Okay, that's Java, as I said at the beginning, that's what Java is, is, is tuned to do, okay? And, and if, I went f if I went to OpenJDK 8, that line would be worse because the hotspot guys continue like us to keep putting improvements in. So nine is really good, okay? What happens if I put OpenJ9 on the top? So OpenJDK 9 with OpenJ9, just, just the switch, okay? Startups faster, okay? Think about this. You're deploying this to the cloud. It's where time and, time and memory costs. Everything between these two lines is more work done. And if your microservice is short-lived, you might be done earlier, right? And if you're done earlier, then maybe you can give the, the turn the container off and save money. All this extra space in these two of these lines is more work done, simply because startup time and uh, reduced memory, okay? And if you really, really, really want to start up fast, we have this thing. So there's an option called OpenJ9, it's an AOT option. So I think I've mentioned it, but you turn that on uh, and in this mode, no more jitting takes place. So there's an initial jit and then it gets shared. What does that mean? So if you use AOT, you've already compiled your classes. But because of the way that uh, Java works, uh, you don't always get to see everything immediately. So you will notice if you look at any benchmarks that VMs take time because when they're loading classes, there's a bunch of decisions being made on, like do I run that initializer or that initializer, and they've got class loaders and all sorts of stuff going on. And the consequence is, is that it can take time for your application to be fully, fully explored. But if you ignore that and you just jit what you can get, get to at the beginning, and you say do nothing else, then you can do this sort of profile, right? where you can start up really quick because I've already jitted the code. I'm not doing anything else, I'm just start up, okay? And the reason that you get this gap between here and here is purely because no more jitting takes place, you know, these sorts of heaps, humps, okay? This is getting closer and closer. The latest thing is about half that, 
right? And it will get and it will get further and f further and further closer. But you get that by sharing. That's what this is about. You run it once. You capture the state of your application. Your JIT is doing a lot of effort to profile you, work out what you're going to do, and then it saves it away. And so the next time somebody does that, then you can make use of it. And of course, you can capture this to a Docker image if you really want to. Uh, but if you run it in the mode, if you run it in the blue line mode, then you get lots more opportunities for re rejitting, right? So you get fast startup, you get less memory usage, and you still get all the options as your application is um, re-optimized based on workload, that you still get all those capabilities. So. OpenJ9, right? It's one of those VMs that we were lucky. We bought the VM for a particular reason, and it ended up actually being a crown jewel. We really, really have benefited because it's designed to do this span of operating systems, span of different sorts of architectures. So we do Intel, we do Power, we do Z, we do ARM, you know, other things, all sorts of operating systems. The largest number I think we did was on like 22 operating systems, many of which I couldn't name now, okay? But it was always designed with all those things. So you can imagine, it's always a very large engineer effort, engineering effort to keep a code base able to do all those things, okay? So it's designed for small, it's designed for big, it's designed for different sorts of hardware. It's the thing that IBM has run its business off. All our IBM, all enterprise customers, if you draw money out of an ATM, the chances are in the back end of that process somewhere is Java. And if Java's in the back end, it's running on this. Because this code base is not a derivative. This is the same code base that we use for uh, production for our um, customers, right? It is pretty much the thing heart of the enterprise. It is not new. It's been around for a long time. I say it's a new animal. I say it's the new, it's the new old kid on the block. Right. It's very easy to use. Easy to use. You just switch. You can go to here, <coughs> adopt OpenJDK. You can download OpenJ9 with Eclipse. You can download, I get it from the wrong way, OpenJDK with Eclipse Open 9, OpenJ9, 8, 9, 10, 11 on most operating systems and more coming. So the Adopt guys are an open source community led by Martin Verberg, basically to provide a standard place for building in um, JDKs so that we've all got the same thing built from the same code base and they provide uh, downloads for you and it just gets better and better. But if you really want to, you can go get it from their Adopt Docker Hub, same thing, but now in a Docker image, you can just go get the code, okay? It is a different beast, and just by switching, just by switching from Hotspot to OpenJ9, you will definitely get the memory improvements. You'll probably get some of the startup, depending on what you're doing, okay? And if you turn on the caching right, in the AOT ahead, you might find that you actually get a really different experience than what you, were, what you were used to with Hotspot, okay? And it's not just me. Lots of people are trying this out there. You can go uh, and Google, and you will hit see low so many people who have basically the same experience all right all right and i'm going to go you're going to say hey so what magic is all this you know this is all a marketing exercise it's like no really it's true go try it yourself switch from one vm to the other download it switch it over try it let me know here whether it works for you and let me know if it doesn't work for you because i'd really like to know okay but the experience we have with everybody else is that that's, that's what we get, okay? That sort of thing. And I could go, I could plaster this up and things like that, okay? So that's sort of my talk. I could add more stuff or I could bore you about more technical details, but at the end of the day, that's it. There's this thing called OpenJ9. It's now run by the Eclipse community. It's the same code base as the one that IBM is using. It's not going to change. We've just open sourced it. So the OpenJ, open, the Eclipse community 
the guys working on it are um, IBMers, but it's an open it's an open source project. You are you know come along and contribute, try it out. Go down to adopt and download it and kick the tires. I hope you'll be surprised. Oh, well, I know you'll be surprised. You'll surprise me. You'll go, oh, I don't get 60%. Um, I, get, I get 200%. Whatever your experience, do let me know. Okay. And it, otherwise, I'll stop there and you can ask me any questions. Yes. Uh, so at the end of the day, it's bytes, yes. So if you want, so on a Docker, you just mount, you just put them in a volume. If you're running, a, if you're running, um, what we, what I'd say is, you just write it to a file. It's a, it's a cache on the disk. Okay, so, so they have to know where is the shared. Yes. Folder. Yeah. So yeah. I, I missed that in the yeah. Folder. Sorry. There, yeah. There is a. Um, if you don't say anything, it will pick some default locations. But you put shared classes, you know, location, and then a file system, like path. So, yeah. How does that manage any kind of volume uh, disappears? Yeah, it'll just it'll just reject it if it can't find it. Yeah, uh, and you can have multiple caches if you really want to get really sophisticated. Uh, but yeah, it's so it's been a we've had shared cache technology for 10 plus years so it's not new uh, and it was it was designed as one of the things to get to get the mainframe faster um, but it's uh, it's well proven and it's designed as a cache so yeah if, you, if it's not there or the file system's gone away it'll just deal with it and as I said and if your application profile changes and you, we need to re-optimize because I don't know if people understand that but when you JIT you don't just do it once you do it, there's always these all these millions of heuristics going on to work out how much effort to put into giving you the performance you need because the worst case is for us to spend 100% of your CPU to give you you know 1% improvement so all of that activity that that um, JIT optimization and re-optimization continues and it will get put in back into the cache as it learns more about your application yes anything that yeah yeah uh, no, so yeah, it's it's there is no obvious contention. Yeah, 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 yeah. Could you take advantage of this caching if you're only running one container on a server at a time? Yeah. For example, when you're redeploying. Yes. <coughs> yeah, you get the same benefits if it's. If so it's it, not two containers at the same. Time, no, no, it it is. Thing. Yeah, all you have to do is do one, and then whether you do you repeat it or you do ten in parallel, they all get the same benefits. Unless yeah. Well, it, even if you, as long as the shared cache exists, when you point back to it, it will pick up. Yeah. I mean, there's no, when I took, there's no real difference in that than, say, like the shared, ca the, the, the class caching in the hotspot thing. Ours is just slightly better designed, and ours, we have a lot more code in there. But the idea of having a space on a disk where you just cache what you've done before, we all know how that works. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, if you, I wanted we. I really want to have a benchmark, which I haven't created yet. But I really wanted to show what happens when you go to extremes. So if you have like a thousand containers, you get significant improvements because you're just all sharing one space. Yeah. Um, and also, if you're doing startup, you imagine however many containers you've started up. You're not now. You are no longer rejitting the same code. Right. Unless you save it, in a, it, then what happens? When you start a container, your Java application kicks in and all the jitting that it did before is done again. You, you spend all this CPU time getting your application to a point which it already knows what to do because nothing's changed. You know, you are, your Docker image is exactly the same as last time. So we're going, well, that's just stupid. Let's just share it. Right? Uh, and we have even more grand plans because one of the things that we've been talking about is if we were to move to more of a service oriented thing and rather than have um, a cache on on disk how about if we had a another service on the pro on running that provided you with the um, the JIT, JIT code 
we would actually be able to build profiles of your application running over a much longer period of time and maybe even be able to do optimization because we could still run JITs, but we could run it in a different process that you didn't pay for or pay for differently. So there's all sorts of ways we can take this. Yeah. 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 Very well. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, so th the mainframe picture, I mean, we run on machines that scale, and we're talking hundreds and thousands of VMs running those environments. Shared cloud, so the shared classes thing, as I said, was, was, became really important when we put Java on the mainframe, because mainframes don't have the greatest CPUs. They, the, the mainframe benefit is in all the subsidiary CPUs and uh, hardware. So we didn't want to spend the effort on the jitting for a really good reason, because it just meant that it wasn't competitive. So we've been doing that with shared classes and very large numbers of VMs for a long time. So it is fully optimal. Yeah. 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 Uh, does this mean then that the cached version won't be, won't be the best version of yourself, right? Because when you cache it, you won't yeah. run into hotspots, which will re-optimize the code and create even a better... No, it, it, it's, it's up to you. You can, you can run it in a mode you say, do, do no re-optimization, or you can run a mode where you re-optimize, and if it re-optimizes, it will save, save the code back in the cache. Yeah, yeah. So the, so the reason, as I said, if you don't do that, if we know that you're not going to want to rejit, we can get the VM to far, start faster. I mean, it's, you, know, the, you saw the line um, back here somewhere. This green line, right? That's, that's basically going, just use the code you have already. Okay. And that, that space here is, is, again, is more work done. So for really short-lived things, you know, you know, there's no, you know, you reach this sort of point and go, well, at this point, I could be done because I've had this opportunity to do th spend the CPU and the memory not on getting the VM running, but actually doing some real work. Yeah. Yeah. In order yeah. to get the best benefit of this, I mean, you have benefit for a single service on redeployment. But to get the best benefit, you have to run all the VMs on the same bare metal, right? Uh, Multiple yeah. Uh, across, for example, geographies or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So what you do is you run it once, and then you take that shared cache and you stick it in a Docker image, and then every other VM you can use has already got the code jitted and, and cached. You do, you lose out on the re-optimization point. Yeah. yeah. And it is because if you're in a cluster where you're going, even if I've shared, even if I have volumes, there's still disk copying going on or between different parts of the cluster. Yeah, so in those circumstances, it may not pay off, right? And it may be, well, okay, I'll just bake it into a, into a Docker container. And yeah, you lose something, but you still get fast startup, yeah. And I say about this ser Docker JIT, JIT service, we can pull, if we can get that to work well, then uh, it'll be even more powerful because we will we'll be able to get a much better view of what your application does over time so, because some of the parts, the problems you get with re-optimization is you might re-optimize based on a workload decision, and then the workload changes, and you re-optimize back to something you did before. Right? And if we can, the more we profile your application, the more the JITs can work out what you're going to do. Right? A lot of it is working out what you didn't do, because you have all this code, and you go, hey, I loaded up 5,000 classes, and you go, I loaded up 5,000 classes, and I only ever called this method in this class, and I never used anything else. Right? And the more we become certain of how you're using it, the better the optimizations can be. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, I'm around vaguely tomorrow. I'm doing a security workshop on Thursday. Anybody signed up for that? No? Oh, cool. Excellent. Um, but yeah, I'm wandering around tomorrow. So if you have any more questions, just stop me. Um, and I think that's it. Thank you very much.